Bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Visit them on the web at RecursiveSquirrel.com. Episode 633, Reads on Timely Death. It's time for this week's edition of the Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob Norman. Thanks for joining us. The ad world talks a good game when it comes to diversity, but when it comes to actual actions, even our supposed successes are now coming under criticism from diversity advocates. So what more needs to be done? Tonight, we'll discuss. Also, can the internet survive without ads? Why everyone is rejecting flocks? Why marketers are focusing on car journeys? Plus, this week's fair, fail, foul. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel this evening, we start with the Manager of Digital and Advocacy Communications at IBM, Ms. Brandy Boatner. Brandy, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me, Bob. Hope you're well. I am well. I hope you are as well. Now, I next... Indeed. Now, next, we welcome back innovation consultant and founder of R. Cameron Consultant Consulting, Ms. Rose Cameron. I almost got that right, Rose. There you go. <laughs> Bob, it's so good to see you nice or to... hear you, as the case may be. <laughs> Hearing you is just as good. <laughs> now, also with us, we have the chief marketing and innovation officer at California-based agency RPA, Mr. Tim Leak. Tim, Hi. Hi, Bob. Happy to be here and happy to be half vaccinated. Yes, uh, most of us are half vaccinated. A few of us have gotten through two, so fantastic. And finally, he's the Associate Vice President of Marketing Strategy at Arizona State University. Mr. Adam Pierno joins us. Hi, Adam. Hey, hey Bob. Great to be back. It's great to have you back. Now, let's jump right into the topics. And we've got a real doozy of a one to start off with. This week, the news was flush. I mean, just rampant with stories about how brands and their agencies are still getting racial diversity wrong in the communication process. So I thought it'd be a good time to bring into focus the conflicts and unpack what the true problems are. Brandy, let's start with the target story surrounding the accusation by 15% pledge, an organization that's devoted to bringing about uh, big brands spending at least 15% of their ad budget on, uh, on uh, diverse media. Uh, the 15% pledge is, is basically saying that Target has stolen their branding in the effort to promote their own diversity campaign. Um, what do you think of this situation? Is this pretty much par for the course? Is this um, maybe a little too much uh, from the 15% pledge? Are they being, I mean, is it a legitimate gripe? I mean, is all good? Is it all good if you're trying to do diversity? I mean, what are your opinions? What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so I just wanted to be clear. So when 15% came out in the summer around June, it was 15% of not only advertising, but also shelf space of, mm. you know, if you're a retailer, um, your, your shelf space going to black owned businesses. And one of the first brands and companies to, to, to participate in the 15% pledge was Sephora and Sephora, which was great because Sephora had gotten um, kind of called out for being not so diverse or when women of color would go into a Sephora, not, you know, know which makeup to choose from or where there was makeup for, uh, you know, a woman of color. So the earlier when the pledge came out, people were being applauded for, you know, dedicating shelf space or making sure their advertising was more diverse. So when I saw this, I was like, okay, so we're coming up at a year later and now someone's stolen your branding or, and target because target has made, you know, the 15% pledge part of their DNI initiative. I thought, 
I thought it was strange. And I was like, well, I don't really think that they're stealing. Are we, are we not still applauding people for their efforts towards being more inclusive and more diverse? So that kind of threw me off. Um, a little bit, and I don't, I don't see the, the, how the branding was stolen. Maybe I'm, I'm missing something, but I do think, you know, if we look at the year scorecard, brands, a lot of brands need to ask themselves, what actions have we taken? It's one thing to give a statement of support; it's another to, you know, have tangible, sustainable, long-term actions. And honestly, Bob, I don't think a lot of companies can show us what actions they've taken aside from making the statements, you know, or, or taking a pledge or, or something like that. Yeah, that's always been my big problem with a lot of these statements that go out in support, because there is no action behind it, it you know, at least no tangible action, no real meaningful action. Uh, it's usually just kind of a, a like, a, I don't I don't know what the word is, something like, appeasement, if you will. We've got somebody who's now our chief diversity officer who's going to be handling these issues and we don't have to think about them anymore. Is that what you're kind of saying is the problem with a lot of the brands that they're not really putting their dollars behind their initiatives? Yeah, I think there's a there's definitely that. There, there, there needs to be tangible actions, yes. There also needs to be some accountability. Nobody's got it right. Nothing, you know, nobody's perfect when it comes to DNI, but I definitely think Brands need to take a look at themselves to be more inclusive. Um, I've been playing with this idea of brands and organizations being really exclusive. Like, oh, we we do this really well. Or, you know, we're the cool kids who do this. It's just this exclusivity. Like, I feel like, you know, back in high school, only the cool kids got to sit at, like, the cool lunch table. And if you, like, walked by them and you weren't cool, you just couldn't sit there. I feel like that's <laughs> that's what brands are doing. It's like... Well, don't you want to preach inclusivity mm. that all voices, all, you know, shades, everybody's welcome as opposed to you're stealing my 15 percent. I mean, I just yeah. I think that misses I think that misses the intent. Well, Brandy, you know, one of the things that I think about is this kind of pandering versus respect. Mm. Right. So the 15 percent gig, I, I was reading up on it and I was like, OK, OK, that's cool if it's. 15% of your SKUs should be targeted to people of color. That's actually a really good statement, right? right. But I think a lot of these guys, when, when they uh, see situations like we're, we're experiencing here where the African-Americans are saying, thank you very much, but uh, no, thank you. We don't want to be treated like this anymore. We're sick and tired of it. Uh, th for them to be kind of giving money to charitable efforts and all the rest of it. I'm like, no, because one of the things that bothers me the no most is not respecting this group as one of the most powerful consumption groups in the United States. They spend three to four times as much on cosmetics as you know, Brandy, mm -hmm. right? So if you're not producing a product to serve their needs, I'm sorry, you're rather stupid and you're losing money because you're not demonstrating the respect you should recognizing their consumption patterns. Well, Rose, Rose, what about Target in particular? I mean, it's just like uh, it seems like Target is being unfairly targeted here. But are they? I mean, it's just like are they doing enough? Are they? Are, are okay. they? Well, Let's talk for a minute about Target. Target was one of the first that actually had some pretty decent representation of mixed households, colored people, Asian, you know, the whole gambit of diversity. Um, as I am not a person of color, I'm going to turn to you, Brandy, and say, did, did you think that their advertising was relatively even killed with representation? I do. I actually, um, I purchased a number of items from Target's Black History Month collection. Yep. I was so impressed um, with not only the, the goods, I was impressed with the social media promotion. I was yep. prom like impressed with their advertising. So I, I am along the lines of Bob that I think that they're being unfairly targeted, yeah. our good friends at Target, because I mm. haven't seen anything that would be offensive to people of color. I've just seen at least they're making an effort. They're... The, the proceeds from the Black History Month collection, I think, went to um, a civil organization. So I don't, 
I don't see where they're where they've messed it, up. Exactly, exactly. And it's it's a bit of a bish slap, right? Uh, to go to a company like, to, you know, it would be like going to Patagonia and saying you're not giving enough to the Columbia River, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, they they have always been involved in proper representations of style across the color band. They've always uh, given to local charities versus some ambiguous national charity. So I think actually, you know, get your mitts off Target. They're actually one of the good guys. <laughs> but did they did they did they handle this situation correctly? Because I mean. I mean, they put a denial out that they didn't steal the branding. And it's, you know, I, when you look at the branding, you can see that there are certain similarities. Why not say we're part of this pledge? We took advantage of, we took, you know, our cue from you guys in doing this. Why Why the denial? Was that a smart move as a PR strategy? I heard one of the guys just dying to get the answer. <laughs> you asked him. Not, I mean, on that topic, I I can see, I can strain and squint my eyes and I could say, yes, I could see the curvy lines and the way they're using quote cards as the primary uh, communication vehicle. And yeah, if I, if I had created the 15% brand, I would definitely be able to make a connection to it. However, to me, it, it, muddies the water on the good that 15% mm. pledge is doing and it muddies the water on the good that targets announcement should be doing Hallelujah. to say, Hey, 15% pledge, I, Bob, I think you're dead on 15% pledge. If we did this, it's out of respect for you because we're obviously admirers of your brand. And you can see that we may have borrowed the, the curved lines here and some of your, some of your elements, but Let's focus on what we have in common that's positive versus what's in common that's negative because now the story is not even about why Target is investing in black owned business, which is which is what really should be the headline. Like all the businesses that will be supported and the lives that will be changed and new people that will be able to be reached by this huge multinational corporation and their influence. Um, but it instead we're talking, I think, about fonts and and you know backgrounds and things. And it's just it's pulling away the emphasis from the impact that 15% pledge is making and that, you know, thank goodness target is taking a step. And I hope because they're so influential Rose, to your point, uh, I think other brands would follow, but when they see that they get their wrist slap for borrowing a style, or even if you thought it was stolen, which I don't know, that's pretty, even for a former art director, I'm straining to see a direct, uh, correlation between the two styles. Um, it, it, that is one more reason for a company to say, I want to do it, but I really I can't have another PR fiasco if we do it the wrong way. So we have to hold off till next quarter or whatever the, the timing is, you know. Well, I like this panel. Everybody considers me to be the smart one here and saying that they all agree <laughs> with me. So this is uh, always <laughs> gratifying. But um, I want to continue this conversation on another story that came out this past week. Um uh, there's a provocative article on Medium that suggested that in the effort to promote diversity, advertising has defaulted to people of mixed race backgrounds, which the article asserts is really being uh, participating in colorism. Now, does this deserve to be called out, Tim, uh, as bad or credited as some progress? And why do you think that? I mean, what, what, what do you... What's your take on this accusation of agencies? I mean, I, I can see what they're saying. A lot of agencies do default to the mixed race person because they appeal to everybody. And yeah. is that progress or is that truly a, a colorist type approach to uh, to advertising? I, I think it's fair to point. I think it's fair to call it out. And, uh, you know, the it goes back to the idea of, uh, of being inclusive, right? And I guess as somebody... Uh, you know, to borrow Brandy's uh, analogy, as somebody who never sat at the cool lunch table, I, I appreciate that uh, inclusivity. And the the challenge that I, you know, you can totally see why it happens most of the time. A lot, a lot of the times, you, you only have so many people you're going to cast into any given television commercial or ad anyway. And so, you know, I'm not trying to defend it, but one of the things that happens, of course, is you're trying to appeal to as many people as possible. And hence the reason to to try to cast somebody who feels like they could appeal to as many people as possible. And then on the on the other side, you've got 
I guess what we always called like the, the United Colors of Benetton. It's just you pick mm-hmm. you pick one person who's representative of everybody and you put them together, whether that feels authentic or not. And it's really challenging and, and there isn't an easy answer. And so I think, you know, if you can be more inclusive and and I think what the author of that Medium article is trying to say is by being that way, even though it may be well-intentioned, there ends up being a problem created that that you you are... I, I forget all the exact words that they used, but you know the, the colorism. You, you are actually, to a degree, uh, uh, leaving out people with darker skin because they're never going to fit that mixed look that you're going for, and it's it's adding to the, that uh, the, the shaming of that darker skin that that is, I think, unintentional but there and real. And so calling it out as a problem. I think is fair and I think it's good. And it's about how do we come up with that solution? Because in fairness, so, sometimes you get two or three people in that commercial and literally it's all you can afford because we pay for everybody. You know, you, you, you have to you have to pay for everybody that's in there. So it's not always easy. So I wish I had some sort of sense of what the solution is. I don't, but I, I, I don't know that it's an easy solution. And I think it's bringing more people in to recognize when it might be a problem and to find opportunities wherever they can be. And it's very similar to the previous discussion about 15%. It's, it's I think, just about being more inclusive across the board. Can yeah. Can I add a wrinkle to that? I just I want to add one after you, Rose. So oh, okay, you got it, Brad. Awesome I'm, I'm actually wrinkle. I'm going to actually bring up an IBM wrinkle. So I worked on IBM for several years at Ogilvy. And when we were trying to create a global library of images, so we're trying to centralize at least a big chunk of the brand marketing, have a library of images, et cetera. And all the way back then in 2000, IBM was committed to diversity in imagery. Okay. And I remember we were getting doing all of the shoots and we were getting all of the people together. And, you know, we were very sensitive to this representation. And then we sent the first ad over to Japan of of, uh, this creative execution. And the talent had been a chap who was Korean. And everybody else had gone, oh, this great neutral Asian guy, he's fabulous, whatever. Except when it hit Japan. And Japan said, he's Korean, we need a Japanese face. And then we sent another ad down to Brazil and it had a black man in it, a very black man. And they were like, oh, well, no, we don't like black people necessarily. They're they're not well accepted down here. So can we get a white man to show that this is a more exclusive product? So, you know, we're dealing with the issues here in the United States and very often making marketing that has to go across the world. And they're doing it to have efficiencies and controls over the quality of the brand image. And yet when you start going into these other countries, they're like, no, thank you very much. I'd rather have the white guy because it shows it's an exclusive product. So I'm just throwing that as an additional wrinkle out there and handing it over to you, Brandon. Yeah, no, Rose, it's a great, it, I love the that wrinkle, you know, wrench. I'll throw another one, um, a more recent one. This is a few years ago uh, with General Mills and the Cheerios commercial. I don't know if you recall. Remember it, it Mixed very race well. little girl who was reading the Cheerio box, it said for heart health. Yep. And her white mother was in the kitchen while she was reading the how Cheerios are good for heart health. And her black father was asleep. And he wakes up covered in Cheerios because the daughter wants her dad to be healthy. And so he wakes up and he calls the wife's names. He's like, Martha, like, what? why am I covered in Cheerios? It was such a beautiful commercial with this mm-hmm. little girl, this little biracial you know, darker skin. I mean, you can tell she was biracial, but they showed the white mom and the black dad. Um, In talking to the General Mills communications director at that time, all of the hate mail, they had to take down their Facebook page Mm -hmm. because they were getting so much hate. Now, this is a, 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 a commercial with a child, a child, a biracial child, where General Mills was getting hate mail, I'm never buying your cereal ever again, how dare you put this black chop, I mean, just awful things, awful, awful things that they were getting. Now, I commend General Mills after they went through all of the hate speech and 
what have you. They did suspend their Facebook, but then they put it back up and they said, you know what? We promote and we will continue to promote all scenarios of families. Mm. It, it could be same sex family. It could be a biracial family because that's who we are at General Mills. We, the people who eat our cereal, eat our products, look like the people you see in the ads, right? It's the same thing. If we practice inclusivity with intent and our ads or what we're working on is reflective of what the people who are consuming the, the, the information or the products, then, then who can ding you for that? If your ads and what you're doing is, is representative of the people that you're serving the ads to. And then the, the net net of stories like that is are that it really has no impact when a lot of people are sending their hate mail to you. They're never really your true customers anyway, because you already know the, who your customers are. And that's why you're doing the diversity in marketing to begin with, because you realize that your customer base is wide and varied and it really doesn't impact you in the end. Um, other than a lot of scary threats that come through the mail. Uh, am I right in that assumption? I think so. I think you just have to kind of to Rose's point, especially, you know, with IBM, we've 100 years or 110 years old, 100 years, mm -hmm. we have always on the principle of diversity and inclusion, the commitment, the everything that we do. You, I think if you, to your point, Bob, if your brand, if you stand with your values and what you, you know, stand for in your brand purpose, like you said, people can say whatever, everyone's going to have an opinion. People can say whatever they want. We could always use the Nike Colin Kaepernick example. Nike took a risk. It was a $600 billion risk, but one that paid off. And to add to this, uh, another story that was in the news this week, there's more complaints about the racial pay, pay gap in uh, influencer marketing. I mean, is there any real way to effectively solve this for, you know, or is it for better or worse, just too driven by marketing forces? Because this is, this is just an, an offshoot of that same story. It, people are divert, kind of defaulting to uh, mixed race individuals in their ads because they're scared of going too white or too black. So they go mixed race and they, take, they go right down the center. And the same thing is true with influencer marketing. I mean, you know, influencer marketing, the, the black influencers who are out there are not getting nearly the same amount of money as the white influencers or even mixed race influencers. And it, it, it's, it's kind of like it, it always comes back to size of audience and how much money we can uh, legitimately put against any individual when we advertise. And if generally the population tends to gravitate toward a certain race, it, it becomes problematic to show diversity. It's, it's like, how do, how do you solve that problem? How do you make that commitment? I'm going to go back to you, Brandy, because you deal with influencers and advocacy and that type All of communication. Time. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is, I think you could have a whole separate show, Bob, on influencer marketing and equality because I see it all the time. Um, and it, it, it's such a, I'm so glad you brought it up because it is such a problem because for whatever reason, you know, blackness and especially in certain social platforms like Instagram, blackness is seen as negative or mm -hmm. if you see blackness, it's, oh, well then she's like a video girl or, you know, she wants to be um, the next, you know, Nicki Minaj or what have you. And it's like, can she just, like like solo travel and just be like a traveler <laughs> like can she, that's what she does um so it it is an issue but it's it also it, it speaks to the just the personas and the filters and the falsehoods around social media in general right cuz i could have lebron james you know support something and then it would get million because he's lebron james and he's a black man and everyone, you know, for better or for worse, people love LeBron James. Okay. Or I could have, you know, a, a white rapper like Post Malone, you know, promote something. It, it's a, it is a whole level of, like I said, blackness is other. Uh, whiteness is good. It, you know, it's clean. It's better. It's, but it, it just feeds and perpetuates into the dark side of social media, like I said, with these filters and falsehoods. So if you ever want to have just like an influencer marketing like breakdown, like us like hacking, literally taking apart the 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 inequalities of influencer marketing, 
sign me up. I, please, <laughs> I have so much to say. About oh, that. believe me, we take on influencer marketing constantly on this program. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Um, does anybody else have anything to add to that conversation about influencer marketing? Because it's just like, I think Brandy put it really succinctly, but there's, there, it's a, it's a very complex issue that involves a lot of factors and, and, you know, agencies for their part are trying to do the best thing. Brands for their part are trying to do the best thing, best that they can, but you end up in these situations where you've got to get eyeballs and if people aren't looking at the black influencers, how do you justify spending the money against it? Well, and, and here's the question. Uh, how are we saying they're not looking at the black influencers? Well, because um, racism is rampant no matter where you go. I mean, it's well, just yeah, like, Well, yeah, but they're know. also, a lot of them are the originators. So, you know, I think about influencers and I think about originator influencers and copier influencers, right? And I know that a great deal of the origination of dance moves, uh, a variety of different um, cultural uh, memes <clears throat> are from the Latino and the African American communities, right? And very often they're locked in there until some white guy sees them or white girl sees them and goes, oh, that's a really smart idea. And then they spin it out to a wider audience. And we've got kind of these, and and correct me if I'm wrong here, Brandy, because I, I am speaking out of school, but I see almost these influential ghettos that have happened where, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so, I know so-and-so, whatever. And it's only when a copier comes in, sees that, and takes it to a wider audience that that we see more of that white influence and, and them getting more money. What are your thoughts on that? Silence. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm just like, I'm not touching that. So no. So this is what I'll say when you say like, so ghetto in terms of segregated, ghetto not yes. in terms of like urban poor. Correct. People, right? Yeah, I'm terms talking Jewish right? ghetto versus. I just, no, no, I just want to be, I want to be yeah, clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, it reminds me of Bring It On. And I was a cheerleader in high school and in college. Mm -hmm. And the scene in, in Bring It On where Gabrielle Union says, we're sick of you white girls coming here, stealing our cheers, putting yeah. a blonde wig on it and saying it's something different. Yep. And I'm like, wow, that's, and bring it on. was like in the early 2000s. I'm like, oh, wow, we're still doing that. Like that <laughs> is still happening to Bob's point where he's like, oh, racism happens, you know, everywhere in influencer marketing. You can look at all of the, like you said, Rose, all of the TikTok challenges, all of the, it really goes back to Steve Stout's Tanning of America. If anybody has ever read that book, <laughs> that pissed yep. off a lot of people. But it is so true. If you go back to so many, to your point, the originators. However, going back to what I said about Blackness having such a negative connotation, mm -hmm. it doesn't get recognized. It doesn't get acknowledged. It doesn't get seen I will say one thing to this. Um, with the recent passing of DMX, um, who died way yeah, too soon. Yeah, yeah, way too soon. All of the articles that I read from Rolling Stone, um, f from Vice Media, like a ton of articles, so many of the writers, white writers, I might say, mm. gave such homage and respect to DMX for mm. being a cultural icon at a time in the early 90s where he, they were like, people weren't doing what he was doing. Like Rough Riders having an anthem, like people weren't, <laughs> it was really refreshing to see people giving him his just due as a, an originator, as a creator, everything down to his voice, the whole gruffy, rawr, you know, like his voice, like nobody was like doing that. And I think that's the first time in, in a long time I've seen um, a rapper or someone who's deceased really get credit for being the first and like someone's like if you hear mm -hmm. this club banger and you're you know you're dancing to this think about dmx he paved the way so that that kind of music would be crossover and i'm like you know what that is so like i think every grandma in america knows y'all gonna make me lose my mind up in here, <laughs> up in here. <laughs> but i but i think this this conversation that's an awesome point brandy because reading those articles and reflecting on on DMX a little bit i was i was having trouble going back 
and thinking about did he get his just due while he was alive and did he get his just due to the to the appropriate degree you know in the in the lapses in the periods in between records and in between hits you know he obviously he had a number of hits early on in those early 2000s late 90s but when i look at the article about the racial pay gap gap for influencers that's that's the question is this could be something that we look back on and say, oh, we should have done that better. Or that, in, like like Jimmy Fallon has a white girl on to do all these dances, and we go, oh, no, he should have had these, these black girls on. But what would be so much better, and the reason having the conversations out loud about the pay gap and hopefully the impact is that because we're talking about it, I think about it like the gender pay gap. It was like everybody kind of knew about it, and we sort of whispered about it and shrugged our shoulders. But until it started making you know, big news in major publications and, and became a real topic that we talked about out loud, it wasn't addressed. It's still not solved. But now that if we're going to have this conversation about the racial pay gap for influencers, hopefully that moves it up to something that can be addressed because it's not a, a really well-kept secret or it's not something that ha is swept under the rug. We're, we're really talking about it and, and those influencers are figuring out ways to get what is fairly theirs, get what they're, get what they're earning or figure out ways to, um, even the scoreboard, you know, if it's about viewers, then, then they understand, okay, well then how, let me think about how I can get better distribution or who I need to partner with to do that. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation, but I want to, we've run a little long on it and we got to move on. So well, let's get talking about internet survival without ads. One of the few good things about the pandemic is the global reckoning over digital ad spend. Um, a lot of brands this past year kind of put the pause on their brand spending on uh, digital platforms and found out that they really didn't have any loss in any kind of revenue. Uh, but now in the aftermath of the past year comes the inevitable reimagining of what the internet can possibly be. And a lot of people are positing maybe the uh, internet can survive without any advertising at all. So, Tim, let me ask you the question, point blank. Can the internet survive advertising? Uh, can survive advertising? Apparently it can't. Can it survive <laughs> without advertising? Uh, yeah, of course. I think uh, this is... Really? I, I you you, you come down, you come down it's fully... It's a completely f hypothetical thought experiment that advertising is somehow going to leave the internet. Um, but as a thought experiment, I'm totally in. Um, like, like if we, if we pretend advertising is completely banned from the internet or some mystical force makes it such that online advertising never, ever works. Like, so, so what would that mean? I, I think we see it to a degree when we're trying to reach, um, uh, more affluent audiences, like, like audiences that can already pay to, to subscribe to everything, to skip everything. They've got, they understand the technology well enough. Uh, they're they're always a harder audience to reach because they have the means to avoid advertising, uh, unlike the people who need it to be free. And so fundamentally, you, you would it still exist. Yeah, of course it would it would change, such that we'd have to pay for the internet, or there might be instances that are like the Getty Museum or or, or PBS that or, or or you know there there might be government sponsored things that that could bring it in. Um, or, or things like Wikipedia that are that are quote unquote free, but but rely on donations, um, and and I can imagine a a good aspect too because you know so so much of the internet experience that we have right now is is driven by getting eyeballs onto things so that they can serve us an ad, and so we have clickbait, and we've got just really bad articles, and and even the 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 news that we see is driven by getting as many eyeballs to it. And, and I don't think that's great, despite the fact that we work in this in this industry. I don't think it's great for the content that way. So there could be interesting upsides to it as well. But, uh, you know, and that, that's all this, this sort of vision of what an, what an ad-free internet would look like. I, I certainly think it would just be different and it would evolve. The, the article that inspired the topic, which, which you shared with us, uh, Bob, was, was by a guy named Tim Huang, who... Uh, has written a book that makes the argument that the digital advertising isn't nearly as effective as, as the industry thinks it is. Uh, and that once everybody realizes this is, is the case, the whole system is going to come crashing down. Hence the need to imagine an internet that isn't driven by advertising. Uh, and I think there might be something true there. 
I feel like I've had this conversation on this podcast in the past before, but whenever it, people like to paint digital advertising with this very broad brush and say it does this or it doesn't work, and the fa the fact of the matter is is that you know digital advertising does work. It doesn't. It's probably not equal for a lot of people, but there are certainly tons of products out there that that I would have never known about if they hadn't found me on Facebook and and. Showed me something that was really good. Well, I always, I always works. say, I always say, you know, when people say that digital advertising gets point zero zero one percent click through rate, I'm just kind of like, well, that's because you're you're throwing in all the bad advertising going on right. out there, and there's right. so much bad advertising. I mean, when you do a well targeted campaign, you're talking closer to like sometimes as high as nine percent. I mean, it's just like it's a very right. effective mean. But let and me click through rate. I mean, the people saw it whether they clicked it or not, so it has some effect that way as well. Right. But getting like, back to the, but getting back to the main point of the conversation, whether or not the uh, internet can survive without advertising. I mean, even PBS can't survive without advertising. I mean, as much as PBS comes out and says we're you know ad free, we're public radio, we're public broadcasting, we're public TV, we don't except ads they're they're basically doing sponsorships which are ads and that's the sure. only way they can survive because most of the money that goes into public television comes from advertisers so and donations of course right right so i mean there there is stuff like that and it's it's hard Again, it's a thought experiment. Imagine all advertising went away or it was illegal or something the like that. The last time I checked, even donations from individuals only come – makes up a very small part of it. I mean it's like – I mean it really comes from corporate donors. That's where the largest pot portion of the pie comes from, every yeah. public broadcasting operation. I mean it's all from that. So, Well, that's – I mean at the end of the day, you'd have – we'd have – it's – what I started to say, I probably tangented off of it, but we'd have to pay for it, right? Like, your PBS would survive if they sold it to us the way Netflix does. Um, and I pay for PBS. You know, we, we have a subscription that donates whatever it is, 10 or 15 bucks a month, and that way we can stream it really easily and everything, and we want to support it. And you want that tote bag. You really that want, the, you want the tote <laughs> bag. And that's, what you, that's what you're really after. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, and that's the thing is is – I'm lucky that I can afford to pay for the things that I want to stream and, and I can do that. Not everybody can do that. And that's, that's, that's what would happen. If advertising went away, what would happen is people would have to pay for stuff and therefore there'd be this big imbalance between the people who could pay for it and therefore get the value out of it. And either somehow we have to subsidize the content that everybody else gets or we have to figure out something else. And that's always been the great, you know, the upside to advertising is uh, it allows everything to be free to the or relatively free to to the people on the other end. And uh, so if it goes away, we just have what will survive will be models that people are willing to pay for or that somehow get paid for uh, by somebody else. And that brings up the, the $64,000 question, which I'm going to open up to the rest of the panel. Uh, it comes down to our subscriptions now becoming so ubiquitous and so much a part of the internet landscape that they can actually replace advertising in any kind of substantial way, or at least at least mitigate the need for as much advertising as is currently out there. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I'm feeling very skeptical about that, but um, I don't know. Adam, do you have any thoughts? Well, between subscriptions, which which have just been rising and rising, more more content is coming through subscription services but also new revenue models. So I, I look at things like um, NBA Top Shot. I look at what's happening with NFTs, which is not applicable to most web content, but as a, as a way in to a new revenue model, a new understanding of sponsoring content or paying for something. And then not quite a subscription, but pretty much a subscription the way my kids are always renewing their Robux. Something like Roblox where come play it's free, but if you want to modify or change it or improve or enhance or have access to any kind of bonus material, you have to pay for it. And between those somewhat newish revenue models, I think you will start to see more publishers and more spaces on the web that end up going ad free. Inevitably, what will happen is that some smart advertiser will figure out a sponsorship or something not called an ad that will sneak back into those spaces. But but I do think there is a there is a way for the internet to to move on into a post 
banner ad future, if, if that makes any sense. Now, let me, let me move this conversation to Brandy for a second. And taking what was just said by Adam, um, do you believe that any brand in America, any publishing brand in America would not turn around and say, hey, we're making all this money on subscription. Now let's make money on ads, too. I mean, it's just like, is there any way in any scenario that you can envision where advertising doesn't play some role in the future? None that I can think. None that I can think of. No, and I I liked what Adam said about different um, revenue models or the different streams of revenue. But I I just don't I I don't see how that could happen. I I just don't. I don't know, Bob, if it, or any of you have you all read the book Subscribed? I've heard of that. No, but I've not read it. No. I would no. highly recommend, and it's, it's it was written in 2018, so really looking at, you know, just like the subscription, not so much with ads, but just like, you know, subscription models with like boxes and things. But a lot of what he wrote on this uh, guy, a lot of what he wrote is very relevant to what we're seeing today. And we're talking about ads and various business models. So I, I, I don't see it, Bob. I maybe, I wish I had like an answer, but I, I don't, (laughs) I don't, I can't think of one. Yeah. let's Can I throw that question back? In, in the form of a question, maybe to the panel, is do we imagine that Netflix and Disney Plus are going to start running ads? Because right now they're completely subscriber based. Well, I, I, I mean, if I can jump in, I don't think that Disney will ever run ads, uh, at least not in the traditional sense, because they've they've managed to be one of the few content providers out there that consistently can make money from their subscriptions. I mean, yep. they've got plus, such a captive audience. Plus all their content is an ad for their own stuff, you know, right. come to the, come to the theme park or buy the toy or eat the cereal. Right. Exactly. Or go on the cruise. Right. <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> so but what, so and what but, about Netflix? I know I, we've got people in my agency that, that feel like it's just a matter of time before, before Netflix, Netflix starts, starts running ads. You, you yeah. think so? Why? Oh, I re- doing it, but coming I out of the pandemic. Let's be, let's home, for why, but just what would be the reason? Let's be, let's just be you know, like macabre for a second. It's when Reed Hastings dies, when he is gone, when he is no longer the CEO of that company. Some shareholder is going to go. We should run ads, and it's going to happen. It's 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 definitely going to happen at some point. Um, you know, they they don't have the same cachet. They don't have the same amount of brand loyalty and brand. Um, extensions that they can make money off of that Disney has, you know, eventually someone somewhere is going to get in there and say, Netflix is going to run ads and they're going to start doing it. I I just can't see how it it won't eventually get to that point. So Tim, let me ask you a question. You just, you, 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 you answered a question with a question. So I'm going to ask you a question because now you've got (laughs) me thinking, because you're like, Oh, people in my agency think that Netflix, I don't want to think about Reed's untimely death. Bob like really takes it to a dark place. (laughs) I don't want to think about that, but Tim, I do want to ask you, do you think why uh, Quibi failed is because they ran ads before the subscription started? No, I don't. I I had issues with Quibi the first time I heard about it conceptually. They did a (laughs) lot of ads, but think about they did a lot of ads. Yeah, I, I don't think that's why it is, though there is something there is something right to the to the premium perception of a service that doesn't run ads that you know hbo historically you know was always that channel that didn't run ads you know when went back when we watched stuff on television channels um hbo didn't run ads if you watched the same movie and you watched it on nbc it didn't feel like the same premium experience so i think there's something to that and netflix currently anyway is in a leadership position now if that starts to slip right because there's so much competition out there right now if that starts to slip you could see it i could also imagine sorry i got away from your quibby question though no I just, it's okay <laughs> I, but I was just gonna say i could also beyond Reed, reads untimely death i could also just simply imagine you know as a public company somebody's going to run the numbers of how much money they can make by running ads and that's going to be the you know the balance and does it become for the same ten dollars a month you get ads but now you could pay us twenty dollars a month to avoid the ads which is what you know hulu and paramount plus and all those do they just have tiers uh it'll be interesting but just going back to quibi i don't see i i i just think the format was not right the timing certainly didn't help 
but uh, yeah, it didn't know, help that they have this they had this whole, whole platform that was designed to watch content while you're standing in the line at Starbucks, right launch right in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> when nobody was standing in a line. <laughs> right. So I think and that TikTok hurt them worse than more anything. More fun to do that exact same thing too, anyway, than Quibi. So. But I find it interesting. Their content wasn't bad, and in fact, most of their content went up on auction and is being bought by other streaming services mm-hmm. to be released. And it's it seems like they had at least the content part of that strategy figured out. They just didn't figure out the way people like to actually watch content. Nobody likes to watch ten second, con- ten minute content. You know, it's just like it needs to be half hour shows if you want it to be premium content. Well, I want to move on. We're running out of time and I've got so much more to talk about. Uh, Let's turn to Phlox. I mean, continuing this discussion, um, Phlox were supposed to be Google's solution, federated learning of cohorts is what it stands for. And it was meant to bring together the cohorts of data that were available from various brands participating in this network and be able to give some kind of targeting without depending on cookies. Unfortunately, every brand, almost every brand out there, every publisher out there, everybody out there is soundly rejecting uh, this entire premise. Uh, The solution has been increasingly criticized, including gaining some GDPR scrutiny. So, Adam, what is at the heart of the growing dissatisfaction and what are the alternatives for advertisers? If we're going to lose cookies, we're going to lose um, Apple's tra- uh, Apple's going to start uh, exposing us for how we're using their data on the on the mobile phone. We've got a lot of problems coming forward. DFA coming. Yeah, yeah. I mean Tuesday. <laughs> so, yeah, what are exactly. the alternatives? How do you, how do you do this? Yeah, so I think what's at the heart of the growing dissatisfaction is marketers, we do not like change, and all we've been dealing with for the past eighteen months is nonstop change. This announcement came somewhat as a surprise. I think everybody knew it was coming, but back in uh, early March when, or mid-March when Google said, okay, we're actually taking this out of the sandbox and we're going to begin testing it, it came more as a shock that that they were actually doing it. The the critique of it is, and I'm, I'm on this side, I understand this, is that it doesn't sound like Google won't still have access to the same deep, reaches of data, they won't still have access to all the privacy uh, components that people are afraid they already have a a near monopoly on, especially for users of Chrome. But the brands will be put one step away from their own customer data or their own uh, media target data. So it's going to obscure that information from uh, marketers and make it less certain that the campaigns will work or less certain that they're reaching the right person. Now, Google says it's something like 95% as effective targeting as as the cookie environment today, but nobody really knows. You have to take the salesperson's word for it. And until you're able to really get in there, what I would want to do is, guess what? I would want to do a multivariate test, but I can't because they're they're ending one when they start the other one. So I don't get a side-by-side. I just have to know that what they said was true. So the question is, the dissatisfaction comes from how much do you trust this huge vendor that owns more than their share of the negotiation? And there are some alternatives, but it's a bit like whack-a-mole because as Google is doing this at the same time that Apple is is doing it, as, as Brandy alluded to, and um, each alternative that comes up seems to be getting tamped down, you know, through either the group, there's groups out in China that are looking at another way to get around the Apple um, identification problem. There's groups that keep on popping up with alternatives to the flocks, but it seems that Google and Apple independently, I'm sure they're not working on this together, but independently are closing those doors as fast, as quickly as they hear about them and limiting those alternatives from reaching the market. I saw a number of browsers that are saying, we're gonna have an alternative to Flock. And as a, as a marketer and also as a consumer, at least I know Google and Chrome are under scrutiny. And so I think I would rather deal with Google than you know something like Brave, where now I'm all of a sudden in a whole new environment. I'm not sure where my money's going if I'm a marketer and as a consumer, it's like, do I trust brave more than I trust Google? I'm not sure. Just because they say they're not operating like Google? Well, what else would they say? 
So I think there will be opportunity, but it's going to take some time for the dust to settle before both consumers understand why this is bad for them and why mar before marketers have the trust or have the opportunity to test and figure out which one of these third-party players is worth investing in. I agree with you, Adam. You're spot on. Uh, Firefox released a statement. They did their own statement, which very similarly to everything that you just said. And I do think there is, I mean, Bob asked a really good question, but I do think that we, this all comes down to privacy. And after the year we have all been through, I really feel that we are at a tipping point when it comes to privacy. And we really have to ask ourselves as marketers, as communicators, can advertising and privacy, and privacy peacefully coexist? And if we can, how are we going to do that? Because there are so many privacy issues that we are about to embark upon. And again, to your point, Adam, with, who do I trust? Why should I do this? Okay, um, you're telling me you have enhanced tracking protection. Well, why doesn't the other one have enhanced tracking protection? Well, wait a minute. How transparent are you? Wait a minute. Facebook just invited me to a webinar to talk about It's It is, we are at a tipping point. So can we play together in the sandbox or... Should we buckle up because advertising and privacy can't coexist? Yeah. Plus, it doesn't help that that Google is is doing this in the name of privacy, and saying, you know, we're this flock is going to protect people by aggregating data into these cohorts. So we're we're actually protecting data. But then when you look closely, you don't have to look too closely. GDPR, it doesn't. They don't know for sure, and nobody can say whether it meets the requirements of GDPR, which tells me. If it doesn't do that on its face, then it probably doesn't do it. And if no, if it takes 50 engineers to figure out if it complies or not, please, I don't want it. Like, let's figure, why don't we figure that out before we launch it so that consumers can say, oh, okay, well, we don't have GDPR here, but um, it does meet those requirements. At least I know I can wade into it. It's the, it's the one stamp of authority that, that exists. I, I would love to have some third party because I have to say I feel even though I do trust Google as a brand overall, I do have to notice that they have a vested interest in keeping the data. So are we, are we, being on that side of the table. Are, are we suggesting that it needs third party oversight or third parties coming in and presenting a different type of solution? I mean, which is the better way to do that? Because I mean, I thought that's what GDPR was, was third party oversight. Yeah, I'm proposing that there should be some third party, it doesn't have to be oversight, but that there should be somebody else that's able to say it meets certain requirements and because we've seen the the algorithm or the code. And then on the other hand, we need third party solutions that are competitive to this because otherwise Google and Apple will literally own all the internet that we just discussed when we were talking to Tim about can the inter internet survive without ads? There, there won't be any internet left. For Chrome and Safari, that's how much how much web traffic does that take up? 80% more? Mm -hmm. I agree with Adam. I co-sign what Adam says. It needs to be both. <laughs> well, we got one more topic we got to cover before we wrap up the show. The drum through a Waze sponsorship um, examined in a white paper the growing importance of reaching consumers in the car as the automobile's importance continues to be amplified during the ongoing pandemic. Rose, this was always a part of any good marketing effort. I mean, any good integrated effort always looked at all the different places that the audience was and gave a relevant message there. And the automobile is obviously a place where a lot of consumers spend their time. So what has changed and does the auto really represent a larger opportunity than it has in the past because of the pandemic? What are your thoughts? I want to travel. I hate wearing a mask. <laughs> I love my car. Okay, it's it's really I think as basic <laughs> as that. Um, you know, the cars have also become restaurants of recent. You know, when you're like, oh god, I, I just can't cook another meal, and every single restaurant that you go to has no seated service, then the seated service is your car, right? Uh, I have found myself in more car parks than I like to think about these days. I'm kind of feeling <laughs> a little grotty, you know, hey, girl, want some candy? Here I am sitting in my car chomping on a sushi burrito. And, uh, you know, but you, there is this desire to escape our homes occasionally, but we need to do it in a sense of safety. And our cars... <clears throat> good friend of mine used to say that her car was 
her place of meditation. It was where she refueled, where she recharged after these long, grueling days of work. You know, you can look at that uh, uh, migration from work to home and think, oh, this is just a painful commute. Or you can set it up, and I've seen many women do this. Uh, I don't know so much for men. You guys can tell me. But where, you know, I have my I have my flower, I have my music set up, I've got my perfect surround sound, and it becomes my bubble, and it's my safe place. And we all need to have a sense of safe and control right now. That's why you can't get a guy to do your, your bloody uh, fence in the back until July right now, because people are funneling a lot of money into home improvements, into landscaping, into lawn improvements because that is something I have control over in these crazy times mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to change in a huge way moving forward quite frankly because we need that sense of freedom just being in America that's kind of what you sign up for freedom check but we we have to feel safe and we have to feel in control and the car allows us to do that and the car also gives us this hermetically sealed perfect environment where you really can get our attention because you know unless you're fully suicidal you're not necessarily texting at the same time or emailing at the same time as you're driving so a lot of the stimuli that we talk about as major competitors for attention are buffered in many ways in that car. So yeah, I absolutely agree that radio is, you know, extraordinarily important. Uh, we And we've seen a rise in that and we've seen a rise in the power of radio again. And I'm really excited about it. Yeah, radio is just one part of the puzzle though too. You're talking about outdoor, outdoor boards, outdoor yeah. billboards. You're talking about um, pump state uh, pump uh, screens that are at those, gas stations. Those things are just bloody irritants. I'm <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> because you know you're happily there. You're in a you're in a, an alternative state of mind, and all of a sudden it's saying have a slushy. And, and you're like, ah, ah, where did that come from? I don't want to walk into that convenience center. Are you insane? You know, but yeah, I, I'd it, say it worked on me, Rose. I, I end up buying probably 25% more slushies. Thanks to those. Really? <laughs> Gosh, never. You know, I, I was also thinking Rose about Spotify's uh, car thing that they announced this week, which mm. is like a streaming device that somehow plugs into the car too is you're right and everybody's trying to figure out how to get closer to the drive get get into the cockpit of the car with you instead of instead of trying to sell tim those 25 percent increase in slushies which which is good money it's pretty good markup on those oh, absolutely. And it's one of the driving forces behind uh, the industry's move towards self-driving cars i mean self-driving cars yeah. are not just about safety they're about getting the driver uh, yep. off the, getting out of a tension zone off the road and onto screens in the car and it's it's a big drive toward trying, no, no pun intended, but a big drive toward trying to get consumers to consume advertising at a much higher rate while they're traveling. So, yeah, there's a lot to this, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But for now, it's time for this week's Fair, Fail, Foul. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug starting with Brandy Boatner. She's at IBM, which is at IBM.com, as if you didn't know that. So tell us, Brandy, what's going on in your world? What would you like to promote? I would just like to promote for all of the gamers or all of the parents of gamers that IBM recently announced a partnership with the Overwatch League, where we are bringing Watson into power ranking. So if you have anyone who is a part of of the Overwatch League and is all about esports and gaming, please check out the IBM Power Rankings powered by Watson. That's fantastic. Uh, I love to hear brands getting in meaningfully involved with the uh, the esports area. It's something that we cover a lot on the show. So good luck with that. Uh, next up, we have Rose Cameron. I still don't have a web address to point people toward, but <laughs> nope. she, she has... <laughs> You can find her on LinkedIn. I'll have the link in the show notes. But she is a fabulous consultant. She is, if you look at her resume, that'll tell the story. She's been everywhere in the ad business. She's done tremendously, uh, it's, it's, well, you, you find out, uh, executive roles at some of the top agencies in the world. But tell us, what's going on in your world, Rose? What would you like to promote? 
I would like to promote... I'm going to promote Native Americans this time around, Bob. Why? Um, why, what, yeah. what brings that up? <laughs> what brings that up? Um, I I have been giving to St. Joseph's, uh, which is a Native American school in South Dakota uh, for many, many years. And I just want people to be aware right now that um, Native Americans are really suffering with COVID. Um, they have, they're very dispersed. Uh, they are very often in very remote locations. And if you have any extra money that you can give during this time, please think of the original people who lived on this land. Um, they need our help right now. Yeah, especially the Sioux Nation, which is where it's out in South yep. Dakota. Yeah, it's uh, it's really hard. So that's fantastic that you're doing that. And definitely people check that out. Uh, next, we have Tim Leak. You can find him at rpa.com. That's the home of RPA, the agency where he is the chief uh, marketing and innovation officer. So tell us, what's going on in your world, Tim? What do you want to promote? Well, I don't, I don't have anything to promote for myself, so I'm going to uh, uh, promote my, my friend Jason Sperling uh, has come out with a book, or I, I should say it comes out June 1st. And so I'm going to try to ramp up some of those pre-orders for him. And the book is called Creative Directions, Mastering the Transition from Talent to Leader. And so Jason was a longtime uh, creative leader over at RPA. Uh, I've been friends with him for decades now. Uh, and it's really cool. He got a, a lot of really great people to help talk about, you know, the giant gap that comes from when you're the one doing the work to when you're the one leading the work. So I'm excited to see this book actually see oxygen in about a month. Oh, that's that's exciting. That's exciting. Congratulations to him. Um, last but not least, we have Adam Pierno. You can find him at adampierno.com. That's the address I recommend because if you go to asu.edu, you're probably not going to find him, but you will find him at his own website. So tell us what's going on in your world, Adam. What do you want to promote? You know, Bob, last time I was here, I was uh, fielding a study into strategy roles in agencies across the U.S., and those results are in. Mm. If you want to learn more about the shape and kind of compare notes between strategy roles at your place uh, or how they look at agencies across the country. People at all levels contributed in all parts of the country. All the major markets are represented. Um, and you can find the results there at adampierno.com slash survey. We'll uh, take you through uh, a presentation of those findings. That's, that's great. That's awesome. I remember you asking about that. I'm glad it all worked out. Uh, as for me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. And of course, you can find out how to advertise on this program. So check it all out at thebeancast.com. And now it's time for this week's Fair, Fail, Foul, a rundown of the best and worst of advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. First up, the fair. You know, Rose... I wanted this to be fair. I mean, Tesco for, for well, <laughs> let go of their advertising dollars in favor of encouraging people to visit their local pub because the, yeah. you know, UK is opening up again, starting to slowly open up and allowing people to go to their local pub. And Tesco was great about supporting local businesses, except that all the people went to the pubs and they completely ignored the, <laughs> the, the rule of six and <laughs> weren't wearing masks and... It was a real mm -hmm. crap show going on. I mean, it was like looked like somewhere in the American Midwest. I mean <laughs> <laughs> now, you've got to understand, I, I'm in constant contact, as you know, with home, Scotland. And the restrictions have been so extreme. Yes. They, they really have been very extreme for quite a long time now. People are going mental. <laughs> They've had enough. So Tesco actually coming out and saying, hey, go to the pub. I appreciate it because... Here's the gig. Um, a while ago, uh, when smoking was made illegal across the vast majority of Britain in public places, a lot of the pubs, which are a key part, central part of our tradition of alcoholism, uh, <laughs> were really hurt because when people stopped smoking in the pubs, they suddenly realized how vile smelling all these pubs were because the upholstery had been sucking up the smell of cigarette smoke for so long. <laughs> and they do <laughs> <It> smell was, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> they're absolutely vile. So they went through that and then they got COVID. So, you know, I think it is very gracious of Tesco and, you know, just they, they've been hit so hard 
by Aldi and Little, and this is their ability to say, hey, if we're going to differentiate ourselves in our marketplace, it's through our knowledge of our community and this very distinctive British culture. And I think that's where a lot of what they're doing is coming from, is differentiating and, and separating themselves from Aldi and Little that are just really creating havoc in the grocery supermarket arena in Britain. Now, the fail of this week, I'm going to give to Korean cosmetic brand Innisfree. Um, Brandy, uh, they tried to distinguish themselves for having a paper bottle saying it was eco-friendly and that they were doing good by the environment until customers sliced into it to find out that it was really a paper-covered plastic bottle. <laughs> I mean, this is just, I mean, Bob, I don't know how you found this, but, but my goodness, haven't we, I mean, no more plastics. But then to have your customer slice into it and realize it's a paper covered plastic bottle. Did did you see Bob? Did they did they give any kind of public apology or? They did. They apologized they and pulled it. Was it. one thing, or did they? I mean, is it just just a, a, a fail completely? No, they apologized. Of course, they apologized. Okay, they they apologize. were forced to. But what, what I like, Bob, though, is they apologized for not delivering the information accurately. <laughs> but, but the label says, "Hello, I'm a paper bottle." I'm a paper bottle, not a plastic bottle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so just so everybody, gray area in there. Yeah. Just so everybody's absolutely clear, Tetra Packs are like 10 to 13 layers of a mixture of paper, plastic, and a variety of other things that cannot be recycled except through Tetra's recycling plants. Ah. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're buying packaging. Crazy, crazy. Well, the foul of this week I'm going to give to Google. Um, Google accused uh, by a lot of the states that are suing them right now of using advertisers' publishing data – uh, publisher data to favor the bidding uh, of their own clients. So it's 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 really getting ugly, Tim. The more they dig into this, the more they're finding out that Google has been doing some pretty nefarious things behind the scenes when it comes to ads and bidding. Google? Yeah, I know. Surprising, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. You know, um, it's hard to say. You know, we were already talking earlier about Google as well, and and uh, and and flocks, and uh, I, you know, they control all the data, and they're going to do stuff, and we're going to like some of it, we're not going to like some of it. So uh, I, I wish I understood enough about it to to, to say that I'm surprised or or not, but. Um, I don't really want to upset the Google overlords because they could make my life really hard. <laughs> Isn't that true for all of us? Which makes me wonder why I do this show sometimes. Well, anyway, <laughs> if you'd like to subscribe, to this, <laughs> if you'd like to uh, have a suggestion for this list or just want to discuss it, comment online, use the hashtag fair, fail, foul. That's pound fair, fail, foul. I'm back on track. So, well, that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, we've also provided a direct link to our listing there, or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory on the Apple Podcasts app. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then. Really emotional, and then Tim <laughs> was like, "Because of Reed's untimely death, I was like, shit. So I guess we're we're just killing off Reed.' <laughs> build on that. He seems like a nice guy. I don't I don't want to, I don't want to think about his untimely past. He's just too hot. So I was like, wow, Bob's like when he dies. I was like, oh god, Reed, no. It's just a thought exercise. He's okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's really all right.
beans.